Hello, Dr. Saltman. Thank you for coming and being interviewed today. Uh, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself? Uh, my name's Dr. Erin Marie Saltman, and I work for a think tank based in London, and it's an action-oriented think tank, so we develop programs around preventing and countering violent extremism. Where does your interest in extremism come from? Well, it was accidental. It's not every little girl's dream to deal with neo-Nazis and jihadists. <laughs> but uh, during my master's, I actually spent a year in Hungary, living in Budapest. And I was looking at youth politics. And I wrote all about young political identities. And a lot of young people in university were joining far-right movements and quite neo-nationalist far-right movements. And so I wrote about why. So the influence of media, families, social groups, political parties, and friend circles. And this turned into a passion that continued through my PhD of looking at these processes of radicalization, but also political socialization. And I was hired by a think tank after my PhD that specialized mostly in Islamist extremism. So we actually could say that these are really similar. We shouldn't think that it's a completely different process between different forms of violent extremism. And that's continued from there. Why Hungary? Hungary was just entering the EU when I went out to live there. It had just entered. And uh, I was interested in political identities. So in America, you're really influenced by your parents' political identity and families. And if you go against that, that can really cause tension in the family. But in Hungary, their parents had never voted. They had been under a system with one political party. So all of a sudden, these young people are able to vote for different political parties. How are you deciding who to vote for? Because without that family background, these other influences can become really important. So that's how it led me to Hungary. Plus, Budapest is beautiful. It's, uh, <laughs> I recommend going there. Right. <laughs> All right. Are there patterns in sociological characteristics, such as age or gender, that are present in members of extremist groups? It's always easier to want to think that we have a distinct profile on violent extremists. It would be a lot easier if we could think that they're all sociopaths or they're all horrible people or they all come from this very particular background where their fathers abandoned them so they must be dysfunctional. Right. And what's really sad is although there are some broader trends, especially around foreign terrorist fighters, tend to be a little younger perhaps in the late teens, early 20s, some broad factors around in Europe, perhaps their second or third generation migrants from different backgrounds, that makes you a little more vulnerable, but actually we see there's no one category. So just in a database looking at women that joined ISIS, as an example, mm -hmm. the women in my database ranged from age 14 to 45. Some of them were uneducated. Some people had PhDs. Some out, went out there to be female medical practitioners for the Islamic State. Uh, some went with husbands, some went as single, some went with friends, some went alone. Some came from completely non-Muslim backgrounds, others didn't. Some, a lot high per capita, had converted to Islam. Uh, so actually, it blew out the stereotype. So we need to look at a different type of factor that's not just based on age, religion, or gender. Such as what? Such as interests. Uh, actually, online, we're at the forefront of being able to see patterns that aren't based on controversial factors like religion or ethnicity. We can actually see interest groups around topics, and we can do discourse analysis and see certain trends in language where people are being pulled into these groups for a range of things, but some of those things are really positive. So these groups offer you a sense of brotherhood and sisterhood and seem like a family. They also seem to offer you a spiritual identity. Even the far right, this is the same thing. They seem to offer you answers. And what's really alluring about these groups is they take very complicated, nuanced, difficult topics in the world and they simplify them and give you easy answers. And we all wish we had easy answers. So that's actually a large pull of these groups. What is the Islamic State doing in terms of recruitment that hasn't been done before? What the Islamic State did as a game changer as far as recruitment is it allowed for decentralized voices. So what that means is if you look at other 
Islamic extremist groups like Al Qaeda. It's a very centralized media campaign. Only their HQ is allowed to put out propaganda and messaging. It's very restricted. And what the Islamic State did is they allowed foreign fighters to start tweeting and talking about what they're doing. They allowed the general individual living in their territory to have an online profile. So what that did was it humanized what a jihadist was. It allowed you to be in the home. All of a sudden, I was able to see that this female is cooking her husband a really big breakfast because he's going off on a campaign and she doesn't know if he'll come back. You're seeing the births of children. You're seeing images of a bunch of guys in the back of a Toyota holding guns with their hair in the wind in a sunset. It's like a rap music video. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't look like a scary, elusive, black-figured jihadist. It looks like somebody that's cool or vulnerable or happy or sad, and it humanized this movement. Did they plan this? Like, did they know this would be successful or it just happened to be successful? It definitely snowballed, and they definitely were able, because of the fact that it's now cheaper, faster, and easier to create content online, they were able to make themselves seem bigger than they were at first. And it was almost like they were able to build upon that momentum. So they were talking about the fact that they wanted people from all over the world and highlighting people that were from different parts of the world and that attracted people from those parts of the world. So you had people tweeting and messaging in their local languages. So you had it fluently in German, Russian, English, French, Arabic. All of a sudden, your propaganda was completely localized and tailored to its target audience. So when we look at ISIS, we see that they've become really successful at spreading an online propaganda and online ideology. So does that mean that their land territory claims are less important because in a way their Islamic State exists online in a virtual world? Islamic State has changed the nature of jihadist recruitment and existence in two primary ways. And one is the fact that they actually claimed to have a caliphate, this territory, which gave them huge symbolic legitimacy, but also allowed them to then call for hijra instead of just jihad. So jihad is the struggle and that's how they can recruit combatants. But by having a statehood, they actually allowed them to call for migration. And that's a very different call. What that means is that then you can start recruiting not just for fighters, but for imams, architects, engineers, women to come and be wives and propaganda disseminators as well. So all of a sudden you're recruiting a completely broader cohort and one plays into the other. So the online aspect gave them a tool to be able to reach and communicate in unprecedented ways that didn't exist 10 years ago. We didn't have such easy, cheap technology 10 years ago. And it also allowed them to start communicating to different audiences. So the fact that we did have people that were doctors or qualified hackers, they've recruited a lot of hackers, and they have a very strong media agenda. So they have multiple different channels, some that cater to Western audiences, others that cater to the region. They have propaganda that is aimed at fear tactics, so beheading videos, shock tactics, and then others that are aimed at the soft side of family building and recruitment. And these are different wings of their media agenda. And not all of it has to be in Islamic State territory. Uh, they can actually outsource this to different supporters in different parts of the world. But that on the ground territory is very important for them as a symbol of why they're different than previous efforts before them. That makes sense. So they have the land as their legitimacy sort of claim, but given that they have this virtual in infrastructure, do you think that if military was successful and completely dismantled the Islamic State on the ground, would it still exist in the virtual world? That is a good question. And actually, some people have called it a virtual caliphate. So previous preachers, even outside of ISIS, pre-ISIS, talked about the fact that you could create an online caliphate and actually have rules and regulations on the internet that would be the same as a caliphate, which is kind of hypocritical in some respects, because actually the really traditional Islamist extremists would say that you shouldn't be using technology at all. You shouldn't be online. 
Right. Uh, and especially taking pictures would actually be seen as blasphemous by some people's standards. So the selfie culture is a little bit at, at disjuncture with this really conservative Islamist ideology. However, that online side, we can actually see as ISIS has lost territory, which they have in the last six to 12 months, actually they've been militaristically defeated in some strongholds, they're even more active online in trying to reinterpret their victories. and. Also, that's where we've seen a lot of focus on them exporting fear to having attacks happen in other parts of the world, as we've seen in Europe. They're actually calling for that jihad to take place in other parts of the world as a way of also, on top of other things, distracting from people paying attention to the fact that they're losing territory on the ground. That makes sense. It's a pretty clever strategy, if you can say that. Given that they have such a widespread online world and they are successful in that way, is it possible to create counter narratives that are just as powerful and can make a dent in that? It is, but we haven't been as effective as we could be in that space. And what we see is there's a, it depends what your goal is with a counter narrative. Counter narrative is an imperfect term because sometimes a really good counter narrative doesn't even talk about ISIS or whatever violent extremist group you're challenging, sometimes it naturally undermines their recruitment tactics by providing alternatives or providing information. But there's a big difference between preventative messaging and counter messaging. So if I'm trying to create a natural resilience in young people before propaganda even reaches them, that's going to be a very different content than if I'm trying to actually talk to somebody who's already holding a black flag right. in their Facebook profile picture. It's going to be a completely different tactic of communication. And we know that it can be effective. We've actually done a lot of research over long periods of time with different targeted messaging. But it really depends on the message, the messenger, and the platform. So if you have the right message on the right platform, but the wrong person saying it, it's not credible. An example of that would actually be the US Department of State's Think Again, Turn Away campaign. So Think Again, Turn Away was on Facebook and it was the right messaging, but the fact that the government was saying it is like your dad telling you not to do drugs. It's like, he means well, but that's not the sexy voice that's gonna convince you. So actually, we really need to be careful with credibility and directed strategic targeting. So in that sense, Given that, we, so we know that you guys work with governments in your think tank and different organizations, but is that part of the reason that it's beneficial to be separate from the government? So what are the things that you guys can do as your own entity that the government can't do? Well, we're a non-governmental organization and actually we're a, we're a charitable organization as well, so we're not for profit. But it really depends on the project and the program. Some of our efforts are government funded especially in things like education, so prevention programs. You can't just put things in the classroom without government officials knowing about it, so that's actually very important. And governments are also recognizing now that they're not the voice, but what they can do is create infrastructure to support the right voices to be scaled up in an effective way. So sometimes we have really effective activists on the ground saying really good things, but maybe they're just not reaching enough people. And that's when we've also partnered with private organizations like Facebook, Google, and Twitter. And we can actually create online marketing strategies so that these voices are reaching really specific audiences. So when I launch a campaign, I don't want it to reach a million people. I want to target that message. And this particular piece of content maybe should only reach people aged 15 to 20 living in this particular city that have an interest in three different things. So even a thousand views is a really strategic thousand views. That makes sense. So it's, it's sort of similar if you look at a PR campaign, how yeah. many videos were, how, how many views, how yeah. many retweets. So that kind of hits another question was, if you see that your counter narrative video has been viewed a thousand times or the, a tweet has been retweeted 15 times, does that speak to real world opinions or is it kind of hard to separate online social media use with people's beliefs? It's very difficult to measure some of your effectiveness because it's very hard. People always want to measure the dog that doesn't bark. So how can you say, I know that person was going to become a terrorist, but because of my cute video, they're not a terrorist. Well, you're never going to get that. But through social media data, 
over time you can not just measure reach, so it's not just about them viewing it, but also engagement. So how are they engaging with that content? Uh, we can tell from videos if after that video they followed on to another video when suggested videos come up. If in comments, not just having people be able to comment, but if somebody's able to comment back, actually creating the two-way dialogue is 10 times more effective than just a passive viewership. And that's just good marketing. So when we release certain campaigns with activists, we make sure that those activists are also online to be able to communicate with people engaging with their content. And that's where we can see really meaningful conversations that just sometimes your goal is not to have so drastic an effect, but if you can even just plant the seed of doubt within somebody, that's sometimes the biggest first step. It's interesting it, that it is so personal and about the one-on-one -on -one connection. So then if that's the most effective way to reach people, whether proactively or in the, in the moment, is there a way that you wish leaders would change how they talked about extremism or do the words that President Obama or um, any other world leader says about ISIS or any counter extremism or any extremist movement, does that have an effect? Political voices have a very specific effect on people, and it's not going to be the hyper personalized, localized rhetoric, nor should it be. Uh, actually, when we see different governments trying to be hip and on the ground with communication, it doesn't make them look good. It, it actually deteriorates from their authority. Like, why is a government official spending so much time tweeting at a, an al-Qaeda representative or a Taliban person in Pakistan? It delegitimizes them sometimes. So actually, the best messaging for government officials tends to be being able to provide a rational voice, being able to provide information in a really clear and concise way. So when we have all these questions, or when policies are coming out, how can they explain those in a very clear and precise way? And also, unfortunately, a lot of governments, it's not just the US government, use very binary language, where like black and white language, which is exactly what extremists do. So extremists are constantly telling you who is good and who is evil, and governments tend to do the same thing. They're telling you who is the enemy and who is not the enemy. And actually, we need to embrace some of the nuance of language so that we're not just trying to be very black and white about how we see some of these really complicated world issues. So if you were to give a leader advice, <laughs> would you ask them to not use such black and white language? Or is it possible for them, I mean, to explain something simply but not just put it in black and white terms? Uh, I mean, I do a lot of work with different governments in different parts of the world and I do get to talk to them. It's not really as simple as me asking them politely to change their language. However, uh, we do provide policy reports and guidelines. One of the things that we do in our organization is actually create top-down networks of discussion. So we have policy planners networks and we also have strong city networks, which is where mayors from different parts of the world that actually have to locally implement these sorts of policies can talk to each other about what's working and not working so that it's a lateral communication where instead of one country feeling like they have their own complete path, they can actually see what's going on in other parts of the world and take that on board. So it's more of a community then? We try to build different types of communities. And the nice thing about having online capacities is that's easier to do by connecting people all around the world instantaneously. And it's made it more effective. You can actually feel like you have a community online. So it's almost like the things that are making online extremists so powerful is also what we can use to counter that in that completely, way. Completely, completely. And actually, the vast majority of the world is not, are not part of violent extremist networks. This is a hyper minority group that has just monopolized and hijacked the discourse because their propaganda and marketing has been better. But actually by working with private companies like Facebook or Twitter or Google, plus with governments, you have a much greater capacity to be more effective. You just need the right strategy. That's very cool. So given that your work involves being sort of in this world of extremism, is this a hard job? Uh, it's not an easy job, <laughs> I would say. I, I think for me, I loved academia, but sometimes academic papers ended at the point of which I wanted to start. So sometimes an academic paper ends with, 
this is a problem, here's why it's a problem. And that's when I started asking questions about, well, what are you gonna do about it? You're the expert, you just did this research, so now what? And the now what is the really interesting part. So to be in a think tank where we do the research and the research leads to our pilot projects. And from those pilot projects, we can see what is working and not working and analyze why and expand what works and tell other people why something didn't work. That's when you can see really meaningful change on the ground. So instead of just focusing on violent extremism, which can be a very depressing topic at times, to be part of different ways of trying to find solutions is actually really inspiring. That's great. Well, thank you so much for coming in thank and talking to us.